it is good to be at church this morning. It might be that um, as you're having a tea or coffee or lunch afterwards, you, you have a meaningful conversation and you get to speak in someone's life or, or they speak into yours and you go, it's good to be part of the church family. Or it might be as we share the word in the next few minutes that God speaks to you as well. But I really want you to know it's not by chance you're here this morning. Okay. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that um, we can come into your presence on a Sunday morning. I thank you so much, Lord, that part of your plan for our lives is that we have a day of the week that we slow down and in that time we focus on you. So, Lord, it is so good to come into your presence, to worship you, to get to sing songs of admiration about who you are and how awesome you are. It's so good to be able to come to church in a country where we're free to hear your word, where we can read your scriptures in a language we can understand. And let us never take that freedom for granted. So Lord, as we just um, rest in your presence this morning, I pray, Lord, that you would speak into our hearts, that we would have soft hearts to hear your word and would be transformed by your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Amen. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Colin, I'm part of the leadership team here at Village Baptist and it's a real privilege to bring you the word this morning. Um, and we're, we're looking at Galatians at the moment. Um, but before we go into that, I'd just like to ask a question of who was in Ahriri about six o'clock last night? Anything fun going on there? Yeah. So yesterday morning we found out that the world championships for short distance triathlon were going on in Ahariri yesterday. And anyone that knows me knows I like triathlon and it's been one of the ways I've coped with midlife is to do a little bit of triathlon. And so when I heard that the world championships were on in Ahariri last night, I went race down and um, four o'clock got to see the, the elite women of the world, literally from the world, from Spain and from China and Hungary racing. And it was cool. And we then stayed and for another hour and watched these elite men race. And I have to say, I was just captivated. I was absolutely blown away by these athletes at the peak of their performance. And we saw this guy called Hayden Wild, and he's a, a Kiwi. And he didn't have a very good swim. He came out right at the back of the pack of swimming. And I, I you know, although I love triathlon, I don't watch very much on TV. And I knew his name and I knew he was a Kiwi, but I didn't know much about him. And what happened was, because he had a bad swim, he then got stuck at the back on the bike, and cyclists move in big groups, and if you're at the front, it's easier, and the back, it's hard work. And he, he just sort of just kept going and going and going through, through the bike, but didn't make much progress. So when he came off to do his 5K run at the end, he was 30 seconds behind the leader. Now, that doesn't sound like very much, and if you look at how Colin runs, it's, it's not very much, because I take a long time to run anywhere. But when these guys are running a kilometre in under three minutes, a 30-second gap is a lot to close off over five kilometres. And we, as a crowd, just watched this guy, Hayden, and he just ran, and he ran, and he ran. And over the course of five kilometres, he went from about 30th position up to second. And it was just like he was on fire, and he just sailed through these professional athletes, and he ran. And the crowds were cheering and cheering and cheering as he came home and got the silver medal last night. And I have to confess, I was just completely caught up in the moment last night, and I was like, I just love this, I love sport, it's awesome. And then when you start t talking this morning, what I thought was, what a reflection that is, that these guys are so passionate and so focused on their sport, they really give everything to it. Just like Paul talks about running their race. These are the pinnacles of athletes today, running their race, complete determination, complete focus. And that's what he wants us to be like in our race. And yes, I race triathlon, but not like those guys do. But the race that God has called me to is my relationship with him. And that's our challenge for this morning, is our relationship with Jesus. And are we really going to go with it? Are we going to show the same level of passion that allows people to become elite athletes? Because that's what Jesus wants us to do. 
Now, the great thing about Galatians, it's one of those books that's just real. It's about real people who are getting it wrong all the time. And I really relate to that because it gives me a freedom to be real and to get it wrong and stand up here on a Sunday morning and going, I'm getting it wrong. It's okay. Because actually that's the sort of people that God wants us to be is real people. So we're halfway through a three-part series now looking at the book of Galatians. Last week we focused in on chapters one and two. Um, This week we're going to have a look at chapters three and four, and then next week we'll we'll have a look at the last two chapters. For those that you who weren't here last week, I'll just remind you who the letter of Galatians was written to. So it was written by the Apostle Paul to a group of churches that he had planted about a year before in an area called Asia Minor. Now that's modern day Turkey. And these churches were predominantly made up of people who weren't of Jewish background. So they were what the Bible would call Gentiles. So they were completely new to the concept of God, or of the living God. And last week we sort of summarized the first two chapters by talking about the fact that actually God is calling us to stay in relationships with other believers. He didn't get you to become a Christian so that you could then listen to American gospel preachers online and just go about your normal life. He's called you to do this. He's called you to be in small groups, in fellowship, in youth groups, and in ministries, and living your life with other Christians. And that was sort of the main takeaway from last week. We also dived into the fact that actually being human means we're going to get it wrong. And it's actually okay to admit we get it wrong because our power and our depth comes from the fact that we're okay that we've got it wrong and that the solution is Jesus. God wants us to be in relationships with each other because we keep each other moving in the right direction. We talked about what influences us, not just our decision-making, but the beliefs that underlie our decisions. We talked about the fact that for hundreds and hundreds of years, the main influences on people were their family and the immediate community they lived in, and how it's then moved into media and radio and TV. And in the last 10 to 20 years, there's been an explosion of online communication straight into our lives from anywhere in the world. We talked about the fact that less and less is it that we are choosing what we watch and read, and more it's computer systems guiding us to what we watch and read. I talked about the fact that I don't inherently believe that computer systems or artificial intelligence is evil, but we've just got to be eyes wide open to the fact that we might not have as much control over what we're watching and reading than we think we do, and we've got to plan for that. And we talked about the the fascinating relationship we have as Christians with the fact that we've got this unique relationship where we're in God's presence, we're in a living relationship with God, but at the same time we're called to be in a church family and to be in this raft broke boat together of actually living in relationship with each other while at the same time communicating with God together. And we focused on the fact that being in a relationship with other believers isn't always pretty. Telling somebody else they're getting it wrong is tough, but actually being told you're getting it wrong is even tougher. But if we want to have real relationships with each other, those are the sort of relationships we've got to have. So last week we focused on the fact that God calls us to stay in relationships with each other. And this week, as we looked at chapters three and four, what I believe we're going to take away is the fact that actually God is calling us to something different to the world around us. And we can't forget that, we can't take it for granted. So what is it that God is calling to us to that's different? Well, firstly, he's calling us to a relationship with him that's based on simple faith, not on what we do or what we achieve for him, but just the fact that we believe him. It's in then believing we're in a relationship with the living God And the third point is the fact that we're adopted into sonship. And over the next few minutes together, we'll look at why these are different to what the rest of the world is doing around us. So firstly, who's Paul writing to? Well, I've already told you who the Galatian churches were. They were Gentile believers 
um, who weren't from a Jewish background, and they, they were a group of people that God had had a rec- uh, Paul had had a recent relationship with. But they were more than that. Here in Galatians 4, let me just read what Paul feels about these people. My dear children, for who I may gain in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. How I wish I could be with you now and change my tone, because I am perplexed by you. My dear children, this word emphasizes how different Christian relationships are to every other relationship we have in life. Being in a community, in a family like this, is entirely unique. Apart from your core family that might be sitting next to you this morning, the rest of the people in this room aren't blood relatives. But we describe in the Bible the church family as a family. The way Paul talks about the churches he's planted are as children. His passion for them is like a father to their child. And that's why we see so many raw emotions come out in Paul. Because to be honest, if they were business associates or friends from the cricket club, and they were heading off in the wrong way, way, Paul would probably come home at night and go, oh, you wouldn't believe what they're doing now. But he can't leave it there. He really, really loves these people, and he wants them to get it right because he sees them as his children. And that's what we see coming across in all of Paul's letters, is his love for the church. It's just like Jesus loves us, he loved the church. And that's a challenge for us to be that deeply in relationships with each other, that we really love each other. And actually, if we see each other going wrong, we're going to invest our emotional energy in trying to look after each other, just like Paul did. So God is calling us to something different. And the first is, is like we touched on last week, God's calling us into a relationship with him based on faith, not works. So let me read a few verses to you this morning. Galatians 3, verses 2 and 3, it says, Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish, after beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? And he goes on. Does God give you his Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? And so Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So here in chapter chapter 3, we see him reflecting on what he's talked about in chapters 1 and 2 already, which is that thing of you don't come into God's presence, you don't come into a relationship with God by what you do. And this comes down to the fact that these early Galatian churches were being influenced by Jewish believers who still had this overhang of the laws of Moses and going, right, These are the rules we've got to follow to keep God happy, to be in a relationship with God. And if we're not following these rules, then actually we can't have a relationship with God. And Paul's challenging the Galatians, he's going, right, when I preach to you, you accepted. Actually, this is how I come into a relationship with God, by faith. That's how you started your walk with God. So why a year later are you starting to think you earn by being in God's presence by what you do? So it's challenging them. We're like, you start in the right place. Don't get distracted. Don't start following sets of rules that you don't need to. So he wanted them to not forget what their belief was based on. Not forget the gospel that he had preached to them. So what was it that he wanted them to remember? Well, here's my 30-second gospel trying to summarize the whole teachings of Jesus and the early church into one slide. Well, firstly, we are all separated from God by our sin. Okay, that's just being human, we do things wrong, and that separates us from God. By ourselves, we can't overcome it. The, the, the Bible was really, really clear. By doing more and more good, we can never deal with the wrong things we've done. We can't overbalance them um, like some, some religions believe that if you do more good than bad, the, the scales will fall in your favor. The Bible teaches us that you've got to deal with the sin. You've got to deal with the things you've done wrong. And it's really clear that as humans, we can't do that by ourselves. The Bible also tells us that God wants to be in a relationship with us. 
So he sorted the sin out. He dealt with the wrong things we've done in our lives so that we could come back into a relationship with him. And he did that through the death of his son Jesus on the cross for us. And then he made it really easy. He said, look, you've done wrong things. I've dealt with them. I've paid the cost for them. I've removed them from your life. All you need to do is believe me. You need to believe him. You need to say, right, thank you for the forgiveness of my sins and turn away from them and follow Jesus. And this is the gospel that Paul wanted the Galatian church to remember. And I emphasize again what I said last week, which is it's really easy to forget the simple things. And that's why we need to be in relationship with each other. It's why we need to keep coming to church is to be reminded again and again what's the basis for our faith and not get distracted. So it was a simple gospel of Jesus Christ that Paul wanted the Galatians to remember. To remember the fact that they can't earn God's favor. They weren't going to get better with God by following the rules of Moses. In the modern church, we tend to call that legalism. They weren't going to earn God's pleasure by everything we did. But when we flip into Galatians 4, we saw Paul starting to correct them for another problem. And that was, they were starting to go back to what they used to do before they'd even met Paul. In verse 9 it says, when you did not know God, so before Paul visited them and told them about Jesus, before you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature were not gods. So here he's referring to the, 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 the gods that the, the people of Galatia had tried to follow, and that was to fertility gods, to the sun god, to the gods of the river, the things that would bless their crops and help their cows have calves and, and these sort of things. And a year after Paul's left, not only are this Galatian church getting this group of Jews going, these are the rules you need to follow, they also had their mates down the pub going, goodness me, we've got a holy day coming up, we better go and make sure that we're, the, the river god blesses the crops this year. And they were just getting distracted, you know? So they had like this moment with Paul and going, oh, awesome, I can get this. I get how I'm gonna be in a relationship with Jesus. And then Paul moves on and, and they start to get distracted by a group of Jews saying, this is the way to do it. And their mates going, don't forget about this. And Paul's going to them, let's get back to basics. Let's remember the gospel of Jesus and not get confused. So what's the relevance of all this us today. As I said last week, I don't find or don't come across many Christians going, yep, I'm going to earn God's a relationship with God by everything I do and following a group of rules. And that's probably just the, the Christian churches I've hung out in, but I've not seen that as a big problem. Nor when I talk to you guys over coffee and lunch do I find out that <clears throat> you're off down the, the river on a, on a Friday evening to to pray for blessing of the river God. So can we just ignore this bit and move on? Or is that actually relevant to us today? What the trouble is, is it's highly relevant for us today, but it would be very, very easy to dismiss it and go, ah, oh, those crazy Christians from 2,000 years ago, what were they doing? But what we need to remember or think about is, what is its relevance to us today? What are the things that we're pursuing in our lives today that we think will bless us, that will make our lives better if we prioritize them and look after them rather than following Jesus? What are the gods of society today? Well, they're all around us. They've just got different names these days. We don't talk about worshiping the moon or the sun, but goodness me, as a society, don't we put importance on things like wealth and money? Don't we focus on how clean our gardens are or how nicely washed our new car is? Don't we focus on external beauty in the clothes we wear, the water bottles that we take to school? What about our careers? If we just got that next step up, the managerial lavra, then we'd be really important and actually we'd be able to have a good identity by what we do. Now, anyone that knows me knows that I tend to live life to the full. And I've got a lovely lady that shared her life with me for many years. And if you buy her a cup of coffee, 
she will tell you that I've never got any of the balance of these wrong in my life. I've never made my career more important than it should have been. I've never been obsessed by long distance triathlon. And she's very gracious and still makes me a cup of tea. But this is part of being human. We get distracted. Now, I don't know what your distractions are. I don't know what it is that in 2024, you might be thinking, if I just give that a bit more energy, a bit more passion, a bit more time, my life will be better. But the reality is, is it won't. Because the way our lives will be better is by focusing on Jesus more by giving him more time, more energy, more passion. So I just want to pause for a moment, and I want to pray together, and then with our eyes closed, just let God's Holy Spirit whisper in our hearts at the start of a year, and let him tell us perhaps where our priorities are a little bit wrong. Father, thank you so much that being in a relationship with you, we can just be real with you and with each other. And Lord, we just want to take this moment to let you whisper into our hearts, perhaps where we're getting it wrong, where our life is slightly out of balance, where we're prioritizing something that is more important in our lives than it should be, and actually we need to focus on you again. Speak to us now, we pray. Lord. One of the things I've always loved about Village Baptists is our value, come as you are. And part of the reason for that is when I was in high school, a lot of Christians were all about being perfect. They were on fire for Jesus and they were living a perfect life and they were doing this and doing that. And it just wasn't real. Being real with each other is about actually recognizing that any one time we're just as likely to be getting it wrong as the next person. And that's okay, because we've got a Father in heaven that absolutely loves pointing us in the right direction. He's given us free will, the ability to choose things, and he's okay with the fact that we make wrong choices because he wants us to be constantly tacking like a boat to be heading in the right direction. He wants us on fire for him. He wants us sailing with the wind behind him but by being human, we're going to be heading off in the slightly wrong direction. And he wants us just to constantly changing direction and coming back to him. So I don't know what's relevant to you. The words that God whispers in your heart might not even be on this chart. And it's highly likely they're not. But just keep listening to him. And when you're making something in your life more important than it should be, just pull back. And my experience is, is that it's probably something you're going to carry on doing. When I've got my career bigger in my life than it should have been, I don't suddenly then not have a job. I just try and get the balance right. I try and spend more time at home than I do in my job. So let's learn from the Galatians. Let's not be tricked by the fact that when Paul talks about river gods and sky gods, that it's not relevant to us today. It's highly relevant to us today. And let's keep listening to God's Holy Spirit and focusing back on the simple message of be in a relationship with me. So God is calling us to something different as Christians. He's calling us to a relationship with God based on faith, not works. But he's also calling us into a relationship with the living God. All those other things that can seem so important in our lives, they're just not real. They're just not real gods. They're not important. We've got to keep focusing back on the real Jesus. And the final thing that comes out in chapters three and four is that God is calling us into a unique relationship with him, where we're not just following a deity, where we're not just following God, but we're actually adopted into his family as children, as children of God. So I'm gonna read you a few verses this morning and just bear with me, because they, 
a little bit repetitive, but I, I'm going to read them to you because I want you to know how strongly this comes across in the letters. In Galatians 3, it says, So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. In chapter 4, it says, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his Son to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption into sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the Spirit of the Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. Since you are his child, God has made you his heir. Now the reason I read all those out is sometimes in the Bible preachers speak about one word and one verse and they tell you a whole big story about it. But I want you to come away with a sense that actually throughout Galatians it's really, really big the fact that we are God's children and he recognises us as his son. So this isn't just something that Paul says in passing. This is something that is fundamental to the way that he sees the Galatians should be interacting with God, that they are God's children and God's sons. Now, clearly people write whole books on that and preach sermon series of what it means to be God's children and the blessings that come with it and the inheritance that comes with it and all the deep and meaningful theology around it. We haven't got time for any of that this morning, so what I wanted to do was tell you how it's impacted my Christian walk. Now, my cognitive life has been from about 10 years on, and since that time, I have always known that I am God's child, and it has made a fundamental difference to the way I've lived my life. My identity, the deepest core and roots of who I am, comes from the fact that I know I'm God's son. The Holy Spirit within me allows me to literally cry out, Abba, Father. Now, Abba is the word that equivalent to Daddy. Now, I have a, a, a job that allows me to become rather stressed at times. And in those mornings when I wake up too early, stressed about work, my heart literally calls out to God, Abba, Father, I need help. I need help to cope with today. I need hope to get through today. I've got an intimate relationship with Jesus because I'm his son. It is so powerful to know that God, the creator of the universe, loves me. He knows me. He wants good things for my life. That doesn't mean that tough things don't happen. It doesn't mean that we've got a smooth sail through life. But it's really, really powerful to know that the creator of the universe not only knows me, but loves me. Now, for any of you that have had children, you know that the moment a child comes into your life, your life is different forever. And that's because you love a child like nothing else. No matter what that child does for you, you absolutely adore them. And that's how God feels about us. Now, if that's not your experience with God so far, then he wants you to know that. So come and chat with me after the service. I'd love to pray that you would know God as your father. So last week we looked at a call to stay in relationship with each other. This week we're called to something different. We're called to a relationship with God that's based on faith, just believing what he says is true, not works. We're called to be in a relationship with the living God, not all the distractions of the world around us. And then finally, we're called into this intimate relationship with God as our Father, not some distant deity who's not really interested in us. So last week, I challenged you that at the start of the year, if you're getting it wrong, just change direction. Don't keep heading down the wrong path, just make a change. And I asked the question, how are you going to stay in relationship with fellow believers this year? Are you going to re-engage with a, a small group or a home group? Are you going to join a ministry team? How are you going to start to have real relationships with fellow believers this year? And this week, I'd just encourage you, don't forget that we're called to be really different. 
We've been called to live radically different lives to the world around us. We're actually, we're in a relationship with the living God. We can forget the distractions of the world and focus on him. So as the, the ministry team comes back up to lead us in worship, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you so much that um, we've got the opportunity to just be real with you. We've got the opportunity to be real with each other. We've got the opportunity to share the highs and the lows of life together. We've got the opportunity to cry together and to rejoice together. And I thank you so much that all of that is based not on what we've done for you, but the simple fact that We've heard your word to us and we've accepted it in our hearts. When you've said your sins are paid for, we've said thank you. So Lord, at the start of this year, I really just ask that where we're getting it wrong, where we're getting distracted by things that aren't important, things that will never really give us happiness or joy or completeness, Help us just to change direction and help us to pursue you more passionately with all of our hearts, our minds, and our strength. May we follow you.